previous lessons, we have gone over extensively how a firm's short-run costs of production are determined by the law of diminishing marginal returns. In today's video lesson, we're going to talk about revenues. As you may know, a firm in a market economy, generally speaking, is interested in maximizing its profits. And any firm interested in maximizing profits must take into account both its revenues and its costs. Revenues and costs are how a firm determines whether or not it is earning profits. In fact, total profit is simply a function of total revenues and total costs. So a firm's total revenues minus its total costs tell us the firm's level of economic profit. Now in our graphs of a firm's short run cost of production, we generally don't illustrate total revenues and total costs. Rather, what we focus on is per unit costs and per unit revenues. So in our previous lessons, we've shown how a firm's per unit costs, including its marginal costs, its average variable and average total costs are determined. In this lesson, we're going to focus on revenues. How is a firm's revenues determined in the short run? And we're going to start by looking at a perfectly competitive firm. Let's go over quickly a few of the characteristics of perfect competition. Firstly, a perfectly competitive market is one with many sellers. Many sellers, meaning maybe even hundreds or thousands of sellers. There has to be a large number of firms in order for a market to be considered perfectly competitive. Secondly, each of these sellers has identical costs. Each seller is the same. This is a very broad assumption. We're assuming that there is no uh, different levels of costs among the sellers in a, in a perfectly competitive market. In addition to facing identical costs, perfectly competitive firms have homogeneous products. In other words, the output is all the same. Every firm sells an identical product to every other firm. Next, perfectly competitive markets have low entry barriers. This will be very important when we discuss the possibility of perfectly competitive firms earning long-run economic profits. Due to the low barriers to entry, new firms can enter a perfectly competitive market or exit a perfectly competitive market very easily. Next, as we're going to see, perfectly competitive firms are what we call price takers. This means that any individual firm in a perfectly competitive market has little or no control over the price at which they can sell their products. That price is determined in the market for the product in which thousands of identical firms are selling identical products. Lastly, based on all of these other characteristics identified above, we're going to see that perfectly competitive firms will earn no economic or abnormal profits in the long run. So these are our characteristics of perfect competition. I'm going to move these up here so that we can conduct some analysis based on our assumptions about the perfectly competitive market and the perfectly competitive firm. So let's look at our graph on the left here. Now you may think that based on these characteristics perfectly competitive markets and firms are probably just theoretical. I mean there really is no great or perfect example of an industry in which there are thousands of sellers with identical costs selling identical products. But I can come up with at least one decent example based on these characteristics. Here in Switzerland we are known for our dairy products. We are known for our cheeses and our chocolate and the delicious milk that we can buy very cheaply at the grocery store. Now where do milk, cheese, yogurt, and chocolate come from? Ultimately they come from cows. The market for milk from cows in Switzerland shows many of the characteristics of perfect competition. There are about 15,000 dairy farmers in Switzerland selling tons and tons and tons of milk every day. Now the price that one farmer can sell its milk for is determined not by that one farmer, rather it is determined by the market as a whole. So if we look at this graph on the left and think of this as the market for raw milk in Switzerland, we'll see that there is a price an equilibrium price in the market for raw milk that is determined based on the supply which consists of thousands, we'll say 15,000 farmers. That's approximately how many dairy farmers there are in Switzerland. The total quantity of milk produced in Switzerland in a given day is a function of the supply of milk from those 15,000 farmers and the demand from all of the milk processors that turn that milk into other products. We'll just call that QE. 
So we can see in our graph on the left that the supply and the demand for milk in Switzerland as a whole determines the equilibrium price of milk in Switzerland. Now if we look at an individual dairy farmer or one firm in this perfectly competitive market, we can, we can see that the marginal cost represents in a way this individual dairy farmer's supply curve. So this represents the individual supply curve of one of the 15,000 dairy farmers in Switzerland. Now we're assuming that the uh, thousands of dairy farmers in Switzerland share a tiny percentage of the total market for raw milk in Switzerland. Therefore that one dairy farmer, this one dairy farmer, cannot set his own price for milk. If this dairy farmer tried to charge a price that was any higher than the equilibrium price determined in the market, this dairy farmer would not sell any milk because there are 14,999 other dairy farmers selling their milk at the equilibrium price. On the other hand, if one dairy farmer tried to sell his milk at any price lower than the equilibrium price, every single buyer of milk would want to buy milk from that one dairy farmer. So based on what I just explained, based on the fact that any increase in price would lead to an infinite decrease in the quantity demanded, while any decrease in price would lead to a nearly an infinite increase in the quantity demanded, that sounds to me like the demand for an individual dairy farmer's milk is perfectly elastic. And in fact, that is the case. The demand for one dairy farmer's milk is going to be perfectly elastic or horizontal at the equilibrium price determined by the market. So here we have an individual dairy farmer's demand curve. So this is the demand for one individual dairy farmer's milk. It is perfectly elastic, meaning that this dairy farmer has no control over the price of his milk. If he raises his price, he will sell zero liters of milk. If he lowers his price, every single buyer will want to buy if this one farmer lowers his price. Basically, what we're going to see is that an individual dairy farmer cannot raise or lower his price. Therefore, the price is determined by the market, as we see here. This is not only the demand. In fact, this also represents the marginal revenue. MR stands for marginal revenue. One dairy farmer can sell as much milk as he wants at the equilibrium price of PE. If this dairy farmer wanted to sell, let's say this is 1,000 liters, the price he would be able to charge for those 1,000 liters is PE. On the other hand, if he wanted to sell 5,000 liters, he could sell that for a price of PE. In other words, if this dairy farmer increases his output or decreases his output, it has no effect on the market price. He is such a small player in the whole market for raw milk in Switzerland that even if he increases his output fivefold, there will be no effect on the market price. There are still 14,999 other farmers out there producing milk, so his change in output does not do enough to increase or decrease the market supply of milk to change the actual price of milk. So we've now shown that the demand for an individual perfectly competitive firm's output is perfectly elastic and it is horizontal at the equilibrium price determined in the market. So this is the price of milk right here at PE. It also represents the firm's marginal revenue which is, let's define marginal revenue here, this is the change in total revenue attributable to a particular change in quantity. So when the dairy farmer increases his output from 5,000 liters to 5,001 liters, his total revenue will change by the price per liter that is determined by the market. In other words, his marginal revenue is equal to the price determined by the market. We've now got our individual perfectly competitive firm's demand curve. It is just a horizontal line equal to the equilibrium price determined by the market. So the next question is, what is the optimal quantity of milk for an individual dairy farmer to produce based on the marginal revenue determined by the market and the marginal costs determined by the firm's productivity of labor and other variable resources in the short run? We're going to now introduce what is called the profit maximization rule. In order for a firm to maximize its profits in the short run, it should produce at the quantity at which the firm's marginal revenue equals its marginal cost. 
We're going to explain why this is the optimal profit maximizing level of output in just a moment. But for now, let's look at our graph and identify the quantity that this individual firm will wish to produce at to maximize its profits. It's clearly right here at the intersection of MC and MR. At this intersection, the firm will wish to stop producing milk. It will wish to produce milk up to this quantity, which we'll call QPM for the profit maximizing quantity, but not beyond that quantity. Let me explain why this is the profit maximizing quantity of milk for this dairy farmer to produce. Let's say, for example, that the dairy farmer is producing at a point right here on its marginal cost curve. It is only producing, let's see, one, two, three, 4,000 liters. At this quantity, the marginal cost of the dairy farmer is $2. The dairy farmer's marginal cost, the cost of the last liter of milk that the dairy farmer produced is $2. However, the price at which the dairy farmer is selling its milk per liter is $5. This indicates that on the last liter of milk that this dairy farmer produced, he earned a profit of $3. Now that sounds pretty good. You're earning a $3 profit on the last liter of milk that you produced. But what would happen if this dairy farmer increased his production to 5,000 liters? We would move up along the marginal cost curve and output would increase to 5,000 liters. Marginal cost would increase to $3. So the last liter of milk that this farmer produced cost him $3 and he was able to sell it for, you guessed it, $5. This farm is still earning a profit on the margin of $2. So the question is, should he have increased his output from 4,000 to 5,000 liters? Clearly his total profits increased as his output increased from four to 5,000 liters because he still earned a profit of $2 as he increased his output to 5,000 liters. So there was no harm in increasing his output. Therefore, it was a good decision to do so. So now he's gonna determine whether or not he should increase his output to 6,000 liters. So let's see what happens to costs and revenues on the margin as output increases again to 6,000 liters. So here we see that at 6,000 liters, the marginal cost rises yet again. Marginal cost increases as quantity increases due to the law of diminishing marginal returns. In fact, marginal cost is now around $4.50 for the last liter of milk produced. Yes, of course, he's still earning a profit. If we zoom in really close here, we can see there's still a profit of 50 cents, even on the 6,000th liter of milk. Now, as we see here, the profits continue to increase for milk production until you get to the point where, and I'll call it QPM again, the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue. For each additional liter of milk up to that point, this dairy farmer's profits increase. But what happens if this dairy farmer produces 7,000 liters of milk. Let's look at a quantity out here at 7,000 beyond QPM. At 7,000 liters, the marginal cost, the cost of the last liter produced is greater than the revenue earned for, from the sale of the last liter. In fact, it's around $6.30. $6.30. This indicates that on the margin, this firm lost $1.30. For that last liter produced, that 7,000th liter, the marginal cost of 630 exceeded the marginal revenue of $5 by $1.30. This was a bad decision. This firm should not have produced any more than the profit maximizing quantity of just over 6,000 liters because every liter of milk produced beyond that QPM the marginal cost exceeds the marginal revenue. Therefore, the change in the firm's total profits is negative. Its profits will decrease if the marginal cost exceeds the marginal revenue. So this brings us back to QPM. At QPM, let's look at that point more closely now. Right here at the intersection of marginal cost and marginal revenue, this firm is maximizing its total profits. The firm cannot do any better than this. If it produces at a quantity below QPM, it, it can improve its total profits by increasing its output. However, if it's producing beyond QPM, it can increase its profits by decreasing total output. And that is because beyond Q, 
QPM, the marginal cost is greater than the marginal revenue, indicating you're producing too much. Below QPM, the marginal cost is less than the marginal revenue, indicating you're producing too little. So that explains the profit maximization rule, which says that in order to maximize total profits, a firm in a perfectly competitive market, or as we're going to see any market for that matter, should produce a quantity at which the marginal revenue, in other words, the revenue earned from the sale of the last unit, equals the marginal cost, which is the cost of producing the last unit. In this lesson, we have gone over how demand is determined for a perfectly competitive seller's output. It is determined by the price established in the market for that firm's output. In a market in which there are thousands of identical sellers facing identical costs, an individual firm has no control over the market price. Hence, the firms in perfectly competitive markets are price takers. We have not yet shown the level of economic profit that a firm will earn in the short run and in the long run in a perfectly competitive market. We will show that in a later video. But we have shown that in order to maximize its profits, or as we will see, minimize its losses, a perfectly competitive firm should produce up to the point where its marginal cost equals its marginal revenue. Anything beyond that, the firm can increase its profits by reducing output. Anything below that, a firm can increase its profits by increasing output. In our next lesson, we're going to add the average total cost and average variable cost curves to our perfectly competitive firm diagram to determine the level of economic profit that a firm is earning based on its average revenue and its average total cost, which would give us the per unit profit. And then we'll see what the implications of low entry barriers are to the likelihood of a perfectly competitive firm earning profits in the long run.